on to the next section and then we will have another panel so we can pick up the stuff as well. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Okay, so next, there's a, this is a shortest segment and it's only two slots, um, but I think it was, would be worthwhile to discuss not only the higher level scheduler abstractions that we have, but also that we that reminds, remind ourselves that we need an infrastructure to run this on, right? And we will have... Um, uh, Marshall talk about OpenStack and then Arthur will talk about uh, how this is done in a more dynamic cloud environment. And just as a reminder, we need something underneath. I think that's like worthwhile to think about. So, and we will talk about infrastructure because we need to run on something. Here you uh, go. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marshall Michel. I work for a company called Data Machines. Uh, we do infrastructure and uh, data analytics infrastructure. Uh, so you'll, we do a lot of uh, Docker, Kubernetes, OpenStack. Where that's relevant is I am actually one of the co-chair for the OpenStack Scientific Special Interest Group. Uh, and uh, Christian asked me to talk to you today about, well, what's containers and Docker? What's happening? Where are we going? So. Very simply, uh, first, let's talk about how you can deploy an OpenStack. So as a reminder, an OpenStack is a cloud operating system. It's a mean for you to run containers, to run virtual machines, or to run bare metal. Uh, one of the things we do is uh, you can deploy OpenStack using containers. It's quite funny. So you can do uh, something called Cola and Cibo. Uh, that's uh, the picture you see is actually a deployment I did recently uh, just because I did a quick OpenStack to test something. So uh, you get uh, Docker containers and Ansible playbooks in order to deploy OpenStack. Uh, you have other solutions that exist like uh, OpenStack KOB. Uh, KOB is by a company called Stack HPC. My colleague uh, Stig Teffler uh, from Stack HPC actually support that. He's another one of the uh, OpenStack Scientific Special Interest Group co-chair. Uh, it's an extension on Cola Ansible and it relies on the bare metal deployment. Uh, so you have things like Bifrost that enables you to do that on OpenStack. Uh, it's really an infrastructure as code, so it makes it uh, a lot easier for you to work with. What I've tr tried to do for you is, since you're going to get a copy of the slides, I try to give relevant URLs through the slides, including videos, uh, so that you can actually get pertinent information. Because uh, you know, five minutes for all the slides is going to run quick, quite fast. Uh, Magnum is the main. A container service for OpenStack. It's a mean for you to use container. And what it does is that it uses the EAT uh, service. And uh, EAT is basically a way for you to generate the YAML file to start uh, deploying an OpenStack for you to run. So it enables you to run Swarm, Kubernetes, uh, including Mesos. Uh, and it runs either uh, in VM or in bare metal. Kata containers is something that uh, start, uh, was made a V10 recently. It has its own uh, project. Uh, and it's a mean for you to run lightweight virtual machines to run containers. Uh, it runs on the uh, Firecracker hypervisor. Uh, and Airship is a mean for you to deploy an open infrastructure. So it's kind of... <sighs> So I, I did a deployment, okay, because we, we need to test, right? Uh, so you can deploy uh, a lot of different things, including OpenStack, including Kubernetes, including Mass, uh, and it enables you to uh, build a, a unit of scale as your infrastructure. It uses Elm uh, for people that are familiar with Kubernetes, fairly useful technology. Uh, and. Uh, the ways they work together is that they are very loosely coupled. So it makes it possible for you to really work with the infrastructure uh, as, as a service, really. Now, Starling X is another thing that was re recently released during the Open Infrastructure Summit. That's the new name for the OpenStack Summit. Starling X is a mean for you to deploy edge computing analytics. Okay, I'm going to go with, um, I was going to say analytics, but infrastructure at the edge. So what you're talking about is currently it's deploying a Kubernetes to deploy an OpenStack at the edge. Uh, during the, uh, during the uh, PTG, there was a conversation that we're going to try to deploy Kubernetes on the OpenStack at the edge. So it's very flexible right now. Uh, it's really uh, a mean for you to work with uh, running 
analytics that you can run at the edge of your cloud. Uh, oh, Zool is actually n not really entirely related to containers, but it's actually a really interesting project that was also uh, mentioned at the Open Infrastructure Summit. And the reason I'm talking about it is that uh, we work I mean, you know, as cloud operators, our container users, we work a lot with trying to build um, projects that are interrelated. And uh, one of the things that uh, is very important is for you to be able to design projects uh, that are that are working with one another. And Zool is designed to do that. It makes it possible for you to uh, create, uh, like you, you have Nova depending on Neutron, and uh, that explained to you how you can, if you build one, you can make sure that it builds with the other one. So you can build inter interdependency uh, tests with one another. It tests cross project in parallel when you make changes. And finally, uh, uh, I'm gonna talk about something we have just released. It's called Container Safe. It's a technology that uh, we are uh, just made possible, made uh, available to everybody. It's a means for you to test for malware and uh, CVEs on your containers. Uh, we are actually just opening uh, alpha testing right now. So if people want to uh, to have fun with it, just contact us. Uh, but that's the state of OpenStack, and I'm going to pass it to the next speaker. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Eight seconds to go. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so question from Christian was, um, how do we handle um, HPC in an elastic environment and how particularly we do that on AWS? Um, so, and that's a question that comes pretty often from customer when we meet them from the, for the first time and we're coming from an, an on-prem world. Uh, Guess what? One of the surprising thing is that you can do HPC on AWS or in at any cloud vendor, by the way, uh, in a pretty similar way uh, um, as you were doing on prem. We have exactly the same concept. So that architecture diagram is uh, uh, most probably super familiar to all of you because that's exactly the same. Um, having some um, nodes with GPUs that are able to do uh, 3D rendering, having some management nodes that will uh, uh, host the schedulers and the different services that you need uh, for a cluster. Uh, the main difference uh, would be the third layer, uh, where instead of having a static pool of resources, you're going to have an elastic one uh, that can uh, grow and shrink depending on your needs. Um, and then the, the storage layer um, is pretty similar to the one you have on-prem, with potentially the difference that things like our object stores uh, well, are, are going to scale in a pretty much transparent manner. Uh, the way we handle um, the, the auto-scaling part of the, uh, the compute node, is, uh, th there's nothing magical with that. Um, the way we usually do it is we just monitor the depth of the queue of the scheduler we use on those cluster. Like, let's take the example of Slurm um, in, in an environment that we make available as an open source product, which is called um, Parallel Cluster. So Slurm is one of the scheduler that is uh, available in that environment. And the way we do it is on the management node, uh, we just have a cron job that spawns every minute and that uh, look at the depth of the queue. And looking at the depth of the queue, it computes the number of cores that are required by all the jobs in the queue. And then it adjusts the size of a construction called an elastic group, uh, an auto-scaling group, sorry. And that auto-scaling group is going to spawn uh, the number of nodes to satisfy that requirement. And of course, you can put limits in the size of that auto scaling group, upper bound, lower bound, and it's going to add the number of nodes that are required to uh, launch all, all the jobs up to the limit. What's going to happen next is those jobs are going to start, uh, uh, those nodes are going to start, or going to install themselves with our imaging system. Uh, Slurm will start on them, and as soon as they're ready, uh, they're going to send a message to one of our uh, uh, distributed 
queuing system. And on the management node, uh, uh, another cron job is going to pull that queue, detect that new nodes have been added to the pool of resources, and it's going to dynamically add them to the Slurm configuration. And Slurm will pick up and store the job. That's pretty simple, and, and that's the way we usually tend to manage those things. And uh, another way of doing it, uh, uh, and that's the way we do it with uh, AWS Batch, is um, we have slightly more control about how AWS Batch manages its, its resources because we don't have to handle a, uh, and there's nothing about saying it that way, a legacy scheduler with a real daemon. We, we have a more distributed thing behind AWS Batch and so we can handle the allocation both with something like an auto scaling group or by scheduling immediately a large number of job in a f uh, of nodes in a fleet, but at, at the end the result is pretty much the same. We grow and shrink depending on uh, uh, the depth of the queue. Um, yeah, any well questions or later? Sorry. Yeah, cool. Questions are later. I, this is just a brief like two slot segment that we, we introduced. I think we can make the panel of the infrastructure also part of the next panel so that we, we save some time. Um, okay, cool. So that's the infrastructure segment and I think the, the trends that I, I hope, maybe it's wish list for me as well, but uh, the OpenStack ship seems to go more into the we want to um, make sure that, that infrastructure can be installed easier and maybe gen generalize, be the Kubernetes of the infrastructure basically and then let Kubernetes handle the, the workload management. And the same goes of course with, with AWS. They have different problems or so the infrastructure problem is a decoupled problem from the Kubernetes problem somehow. So, somehow. Okay, cool. The next part is um, HPC specific topics, uh, and as I said, this is like the the next the segments are blurred together somehow. The afterwards, we will talk about use cases, so it's kind of um, turn back. <laughs> turn back, yeah. All right, and yeah, we will talk about HPC specific stuff. Okay. Take a step back to uh, FSX for Luster. So FSX for Luster is our uh, managed version of a Luster file system. Um, so you, does everybody in the room, I suppose, know about Luster distributed file system exposing a POSIX interface? Um, you probably know that when doing, uh, when building that on-prem, it usually takes, well, potentially quite a long time to get it right, to optimize your build, uh, to debug everything, and to ensure that it's stable. We've done that, we have the luxury in the cloud to be able to do that uh, in a pretty repeatable way. Uh, um, we use infrastructure at code and we automate everything so that it can be built for you pretty quickly. Um, so it stays exactly the same technology, just it deploys faster. And to, to deploy it, we just leverage uh, a, uh, AWS EC2 instances, um, ones that do have SSD disks uh, uh, inside, and, and then we deploy Luster on top of that. Um, the potentially interesting thing that we added to um, a normal Luster file system is that on top of having that parallel distributed file system, we we'll leverage the HSM part of Luster so that you can connect Luster with a the, the, the second uh, storage tier that is S3, uh, so that um, the, the Luster file system can be either populated from data that are stored initially in S3 or that you can use uh, um, that Luster implementation to push back the data that, that, that you have written uh, uh, to Luster back to S3. And the way we did that, we, we have done that is we have implemented a data, a parallel data mover that sits behind Luster that just uses the HSM API to uh, uh, get the notification from the files that are written and replicate them back or forth uh, with an S3. Uh, the, the way it works is pretty simple. When you instantiate a Luster file system, you just, uh, uh, at configuration time, you tell it where it has to look for which bucket and which particular prefix in the, in the, in your S3 environment. And then, 
at deployment time, it will take care of the rest. It will fetch all the metadata from S3, populate the MDS with the metadata, and then you'll get the file system up and running. If you do an LS after mounting the file system, you will see all the metadata. And as soon as you will try to get the data from, uh, um, from the Luster file system, it's going to preload the data uh, uh, in the background. And if you uh, um, access a file that's already been fetched, you will get it immediately. Otherwise, the, that specific file will be scheduled to be fetched, and you will get it once it will come back from Luster. Um, obviously, we made it uh, parallel so that you can expect a large uh, throughput from uh, from that data mover. As usual, and I know we are painful for that, we don't disclose so many numbers about the performance that you can expect. Uh, one of the reason being those things are changing constantly. We try to optimize them uh, as much as we can. So. It's pretty difficult for us to say uh, to give you a, a point in time level of performance because tomorrow it could be completely different, and that might hurt uh, the way you design things to use the cloud. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Arthur. Okay, so now I'm going to cover the RDMA device isolation and how we can uh, really make uh, RDMA devices behave like a first-class citizen uh, within all the containerized environment. Wow, ah, something yeah. really went wrong here. Uh, not really, <laughs> it says. All right, now it fits exactly. All right. Almost exactly, but we'll deal with it. All right, so... So I want to show, share with you a little bit about how RDMA device really looks uh, within the kernel and, and what are the interfaces that the RDMA device has with the external, um, the external world or actually the user space. Um, so, so RDMA device basically exposes a connection manager, it exposes the verbs which we use to, for communication, it exposes interfaces for tool like the RDMA tool, it has CSFS for counters and other stuff, and also a UMAD character device that you need to, that you, you sometimes use to run subnet managers and so on. So basically one RDMA device, many interfaces, um, and the way it looks today you can see kind of a blur um, a red circle uh, with multiple RDMA devices that may be in the system and, and basically processes that are in interaction with RDMA device, devices can, can really access all the resources throughout those uh, interfaces. And, you know, we really need to isolate this device, so we went first and looked and, you know, can we use this C group? or RDMA C group, the device, or the RDMA C groups uh, to really isolate the device. And it really turns out that it's really not enough because the device C group, it's, you know, we can provide an ACL per device, per, per character device, however, it's really two cores in the granularity. Uh, the second thing is like the RDMA C group, well, it only limits the amount of resources that each uh, process can consume. And beyond that, we really want to make an RDMA as a first class citizen, uh, because RDMA is something complementary to a network device, to a networking namespace, and you would like to extend that namespace with, okay, that namespace, uh, that networking namespace also has RDMA capabilities. Um, so how do we do it? So first of all, we want to protect. However, we want to make sure that it's forward and backward compatible. It's a first-class citizen on the networking. And then, obviously, it has to not only be at the kernel level, but also has to fit all the orchestration level, uh, uh, the orchestration framework, the, t the tools, the plugins, in, plug and, and all of that. So how did we do it? So you see that the, the blur circle became like a very clear circle. And the idea here is to take that RDMA device and associate that RDMA device with a specific namespace, specific networking namespace. So the same thing that you do on the network device, you will apply it also to the RDMA device, and there will be uh, a kind of a pair. 
And once you did this isolation, then all those interfaces, you know, you'll only see the relevant portion of that RDMA device from those uh, processes that are interacting it according to the specific uh, namespace. Um, we first of all, uh, we really need to preserve backward compatibility because some people may already have some stuff that they did and they want to work. So basically, we can define a RDMA network namespace as either shared or exclusive, where shared is like a, the kind of previous picture. That will be the default mode to support backward compatibility. But actually, isolation uh, really being done by the um, by exclusive mode, and this is configured by the netlink. Um, and then um, this will be association with a networking namespace with new C uh, netlink command, and obviously integrating that uh, into the CNI, into the device uh, plugin, uh, in Kubernetes, Docker, uh, and so on. The way it looks at uh, at the end will look like those. Uh, there's going to be those networking namespaces that will be assigned for an uh, IB device, uh, and then you'll, you'll have the blue, the, the the yellow, the purple. All of them will be separate uh, uh, combinations of uh, network device, RDMA device, and will provide a full vertical, isolated, integrated um, um, uh, uh, of networking and RDMA. So where we are at? So uh, beside um, um, uh, beside what I told you, so currently uh, we have integrated everything uh, that has to do with the kernel and the uh, uh, the IP tools. Uh, so those commands are already uh, available into uh, 5.2 uh, kernel and IP route two. Uh, we still uh, have some work to do with the Docker. Um, is we, uh, SROV plugin and the CNI plugin that we need to integrate that into those uh, framework and then we'll be done and you'll be able to happily deploy those clusters. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. And you can just uh, stay here because we, we have like uh, 25 minutes left for until we have the coffee break. So maybe we do the panel of the infrastructure and this one like together. So maybe a tour. Atu, do you mind? Like, let's do. Or and other people who want to be at the panel, feel free. Marshall, so when we deploy um, containers using Magnum, uh, what level of device control do we get uh, for GPUs for infinite band cards? Uh, so. Let me remind myself because, you know, so it's a eat template. So it depends how you basically uh, tap into your uh, your device plugins. So if you do VM, it's a KVM pass through. Uh, if you do bare metal, it depends on the uh, container runtime that you have set up. Uh, so NVIDIA Docker, for example, same as a device plugin for Kubernetes. Yeah, uh, I can give you more details, but I have to get a, you know to uh, to get in front of the screen. <laughs> is it this S three snapshotting from Luster? Is it uh, do you need to wait until the snapshot is written to S three, or is it you, know, you do a snapshot and then you can continue changing the files in Luster, and you will only get the snapshot at the periods? At a certain um, point in time? No, it does not handle uh, concurrent modification really well. So um, at the time you tell it to push back the files to uh, S3, that's the content that's going to be pushed to S3. And then if you overwrite it while it's being written to S3, uh, you're not going to get the latest version. And you would have to re-push that to get the latest version. And there is no attempt on our side to maintain the currency between the Luster front end and the S3 back end. It's really user-triggered. And if, for example, you were to modify something on S3, uh, you're not going to get that modified data unless you uh, uh, specifically tell the file system to fetch the data again from S3. But, but if I, like, say I use it for a snapshot for checkpoint and restore, if I checkpoint, then I can, like, in the next second, I can 
like s continue computing because the the POSIX file is snapshotted in time, and I don't need to wait for everything to be moved out of Luster into S3. Hmm. Um, I would have to dig. Uh, it's a little bit of a corner case. What happened while the file is being migrated? Um, I don't know. Okay. Well, maybe it's something to catch up on. Yeah. Shane. <laughs> you just assume it, right? Um, I know you, uh, you, you said uh, you didn't want to talk about performance, but I was just curious. Would you talk about, <laughs> what about the performance? <laughs> I mean, uh, have you so, done any yeah. just benchmarks with a reference? Yeah. So, so the thing I can disclose is uh, the data transfer is done by EC2 instance that are moving the data between the the. the file servers and S3. And basically what you can expect from an EC2 instance uh, to S3, we, we do cap the, well, that's not even longer true, but we used to cap the, the bandwidth between S3 and EC2 instances at 25 gigabit per second. So that's the theoretical bandwidth. If you do your transfers in a parallel enough way, you reach more or less 65 to 70% of that bandwidth. So well, let's say 17 gigabits per second. Uh, and... And uh, the data mover is parallel enough so that we can almost saturate the, the bandwidth of the Luster file system, moving the data back and forth. So more or less, and that's transparent. You don't see it. Um, so the limit is usually the, band, the bandwidth of the Luster file system. S3, you can generally consider that at the scale we are using, it's infinitely scalable. I, I don't like saying something is infinitely any, anything, but in that very specific uh, uh, area, you can consider that it's uh, uh, elastic enough. Yeah. Um, I believe S3 is a global service. Yeah, S3 is replicated among all the availability zone within a region. And something like Luster would probably require as close proximity as you can get it. Yeah, right. How, how did you make these trade-offs? Uh, can you share some of those? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So um, our Luster implementation is single AZ, which means that in a region composed of three availability zones, uh, which usually mean at least one data center per availability zone, uh, the Luster file system will will only be accessible from one availability zone. Um, so there is no uh, Luster file system that we are going to build across several data centers. And, and of course, and, and that's also one of the patterns we are seeing. Uh, um, since you need to be close enough to the file system, and since anyway for a parallel application, you need to have your nodes close enough to each other. Uh, the way our customer use them is they tend to have one cluster per availability zone, and the data at the S3 level are globally accessible, but then they, are, uh, uh, they use Luster as a scratch file system only locally within the different availability zones. Oh, sorry, I stole it from you. Uh, yeah, placement groups are yeah, sure. as close to, yeah, as we well, can get, right? Uh, you, you, you don't give us more no, granularity we, we, than we that today. We don't yet offer uh, the possibility to um, to define where in which placement group you deploy your Luster node. Um, in terms of bandwidth, it does not make a huge difference. Uh, that's mainly in terms of latency. Um, so there's kind of a trade-off at that level. Yeah. Putting nodes in a placement group reduce um, the, let's say, the domain in which we can uh, allocate the resources. So the more you put constraint like that, uh, the more likely you're not going to have the resource that you're requesting. Um, and, and especially, we tend to have the resources of the same type close to each other. And if you're going to use compute nodes, uh, let's say, uh, one family with fast CPU but no storage, and you want to get those instances in the same placement group as nodes with local disks. Uh, 
the 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 island uh, that are built in our network in which you can allocate the placement groups or let's say large compared to an HPC cluster, but anyway, uh, uh, having a large set of compute nodes of one type plus some nodes with local storage um, in, in that same large island, that's a pretty much a big constraint. So uh, you just, yeah, that's a lot of ifs, and that's a pretty big reduction in the possibility you have to get the, the, the successful allocation. So uh, the way we handle it today is um, we say, okay, uh, the, the, the latency will not be so good, and you're not going to have the possibility to have the compute nodes and the file system in a safe placement group. However, you will maximize uh, the probability to have your allocation being successful. Okay, other questions? Okay, one question to the SRIOV and server levels. So, to separate um, communication and um, I.O. So, how does this match with SRIOV? Is it possible or...? So, uh, let me make sure I got uh, the question right. In, in general, you can take a networking device and slice it, okay? So you can uh, slice it. The easiest way to do it is to slice it into SRIOV virtual function, and each function um, actually looks like uh, an independent NIC. And they would arbitrate for resources on the network, of course. And whenever you did this, then you can configure different quality of service parameter per each one of those virtual NICs or virtual functions. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, so basically all those quality of service uh, uh, capabilities are uh, available on a per function. You can limit the, give some uh, high mark on the uh, bandwidth allocation or minimal mark, and those are kind of features that you know we've been using um, uh, for quite a quite a bit of time. Uh, also for a, a VM-based virtualization, where we give a full SRIOV VF to VMs, and that very same mechanism can also be used for containers and provide the quality of service guarantee per container. But that's a step towards the unicorn that we have like this control plane within the kernel so that you can use the RDMA namespace to make sure that the resource allocation is not, yeah, is not will, messed up, right? So actually they will be kind of combined together. Once the, the RDMA is yet, um, you know, I'd like to look at it as like you have a network device that is, you know, an Ethernet or an IP over IB network device that can send and receive Ethernet or infiniment packets. And that has also RDMA service. They all fall into the same networking namespace. And then you can configure the quality of service of the entire InfiniBand or the entire Ethernet uh, service that is, is out there. You can, and, and that's like, you know, RDMA is like a fundamental part of that networking interface. Yeah, but now you need SRIOV to s truly isolate and, and make sure that the, that the traffic is not messing up each other's yes, patterns. And yes, correct. So, so actually we went a long way. So we started with a shared device where everybody's kind of using the same, devi the same device. So really containers, they really simplify the, the installation and dependence of library and all of that. And then people say, okay, well, I also need isolation. So we went with the easiest uh, part of the story of saying, okay, so let's do virtual functions. But virtual function is, by the way, is limited in the amount of virtual functions that you can actually provision on a per physical device. If you look at HPC workloads, not a big problem because usually those HPC workload will not provision uh, uh, processes beyond whatever CPU cores there are out there anyway. However, for um, for workload that will require more uh, processes than cores, then you start hitting, you may start hitting the limit of how many virtual functions you can actually provision on a, um, on a per NIC basis. And uh, looking more into the future, we, we really look into being able to slice in a finer granularity than the a, a virtual function. And that's some um, stuff is to come next, but uh, we're, we're definitely looking into it. And once we do it, then obviously quality of service will be a fundamental part of it as well as isolation. But the, the net of it is that it's going to be some finer granularity than virtual function. Yeah. 
Yeah, in virtual functions, I mean, it's virtual functions, it's from the virtual machine world, that's where it originated. I, uh, virtual, virtual function actually comes from the, actually from the PCI space, the oh. SRIOV. Um, so on PCI Express, it started with devices that are functions of the, on the PCI, and they all used to be physical functions, and some devices had just one function or one function per port. And some devices were able to maybe create a couple of functions, but that will be like a handful of functions, because a function has a lot of baggage to, uh, to implement uh, and becomes quite expensive to do physical function. And then the PCI spec came and kind of enabled to do more functions, and in a much uh, cheaper way, and those are uh, this uh, SRIOV standard really enabled those functions to be much uh, cheaper and share a lot of resources in the implementation. And they can really scale. So if you talk about <coughs> physical functions in like a handful or a dozen, then you're talking about hundreds in SRIOV that can, can be supported on a device. And when you do that, those will be not physical function, but rather virtual function. So this is how... Uh, so it's a PCI thing. thing. It's a PCI Ooh. thing. And if you do LSPCI or minus a couple of Vs, <laughs> you can yeah. see, you can see uh, all of those physical and virtual functions. And you can see those are kind of behave like PCI devices. Okay, okay, the panelists discuss among themselves. It's also yeah. interesting. <laughs> you uh, can throw them the, <laughs> throw them the big mic. <laughs> More questions. We still have 10 minutes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we can. No, no, actually, that's that's potentially super relevant. He was asking me the way we do that at AWS, because we have a slightly different model. We used to, to use SRIUV, and some of you might have noticed our Nitro platform. So basically what the Nitro platform is, is uh, we, we've been looking for a way to uh, dramatically lower the impact of the virtualization layer. And one of the places where you have the most impact as uh, with the software driver model, software device model, because uh, to to get that level of abstraction between the VMs and the the, um, the hardware that is below, uh, usually what you do if you use Zen or if you use KVM, is you take the PCI devices and you make an abstraction, a software abstraction on top of that, and you present the VMs with whatever Ethernet app. Uh, network interfaces that you want to expose, block devices that you want to expose. And that's costly because any time the guests need to access those devices, it has to go through the hypervisor before the hypervisor goes to the hardware. And, and the guys at AWS came with that crazy idea a few years ago of, well, how can we get rid of that uh, software device model? And the way they handle it is uh, they implemented some special hardware that it's outside the server, and that presents on the PCI Express bus as many PCI Express devices as we need for the, for the guests. So whenever you are launching a, a VM on an AWS piece of hardware, what happens is that there is a card outside the box that is creating a new PCI Express device on the PCI Express bus and then the hypervisor is just building a pass-through to that device and the guest directly access that fake device that's hardware emulated and he has full control over it and that's true for the network interfaces but also also true for uh, the block devices the same type of hardware presents a NVMe drive on the PCI Express bus, which is, in fact, an EBS volume that's far away on the network. Same for the internal, uh, what, what looks like the local disks, the SSDs that might be in the box, and the, and the, the SSDs are actually really close to the box, but there is an interposer board that presents uh, fake NVMe devices and that sits in the middle uh, doing things like doing encryption on the fly and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's it's so close to virtual, virtual functions? functions yeah, I, I, believe that, uh, yeah. I believe that what you call a device in the PCI lingo, it will be called a PCI function, right? Yeah. So when you do LSPCI, you'll well, see those devices which are actually functions if you have just... Uh, yeah, not exactly because it really appears 
as a real device with its own address. But yeah, yeah you can, that's close. I guess, yeah, you can also emulate if you want to create many kind of physical functions. You can just emulate a PCI switch and behind that you can do uh, multiple devices. Yeah, those things, but this, it's really the same, the same concept. Um, I think one more thing to add because like on... When you do the software, the software layer in the hypervisor, um, it, it really kills the RDMA. So a lot of the HPC would uh, have never used it because it will limit you to TCP. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, it will not be high performance anyway. So um, actually, this pastor is a very important capability that you can actually take a device from the PCI and directly assign it to a VM, and then that VM will get not only good performance because it's just like directly connected to the device, but also can get all the features and functionality of that device, including RDMA. The, um, the storage technology you mentioned, it's interesting. We, we have the same uh, uh, technology also available in, in our SmartNICs, and uh, uh, it's, it's really cool because what you can, can do um, is, you, as you mentioned, the, the host will see NVMe devices. You can also pass them through or just uh, virtualize them to the hypervisor. And then whatever read or write that you get, you can actually intercept them inside the SmartNIC and kind of connect them to whatever you want. So I'm, I, I guess in, in AWS, it's well, already connected. Yeah, you're, but you're, uh, you're it's a playground, it. interesting playground yeah. to whoever you're, has a smart thing. Your guess can even go further because uh, all these things, we have implemented them after we acquired Annapurna Lab, could just happen to be from the same country. So I'm sure it's, there are people from Mellanox and from Anatol yeah. Labs that have transited in between the two. It's actually not only in the same country. Yeah, it's, it's the same it's, people. It's actually, <laughs> no, no, it's actually in the same country, in the same small town called Yokneam that I'm sure nobody exactly. has ever well, been I there. I've <laughs> 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 been in Yokneam. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually from the same, actually from the same town, the same road, but different uh, building. Yeah. <laughs> There's no magic beyond that. <laughs> so Just on, coincidence. On the uh, OpenStack side, sorry, I'm, you know. <laughs> no, it's uh, good. Like. Uh, this type of uh, work is also done through uh, device abstraction uh, in the sense that uh, they are building uh, pass-throughs for uh, new devices. There's a project called Cyborg, uh, whose entire aim is actually to give you access directly to accelerators so you're talking FPGAs, you're talking, uh, uh, you know, GPUs or anything where you can give it an API uh, to make it possible uh, for people that need those type of resources, you know, uh, uh, to be able to uh, tap into the resource and pass them either to your uh, virtual machine to your bare metal or to whatever container uh, you do, but it's, all, it's a set of APIs that makes that possible. So same same idea here. Okay, five minutes. We have five minutes left. Five minutes for a longer coffee break. Yeah, yeah well, five minutes longer coffee break, but the okay. coffee break yeah. is half an hour, so, so it's I fine. I have one last question mm -hmm. to my neighbor. Uh, you mentioned using Firecracker. Can you tell us slightly more? Maybe, I don't I'm know sure. if so everybody it, knows what Firecracker is. Uh, so uh, it was announced at the uh, last Open Infrastructure Summit, and uh, so... You can talk more about Firecracker because I, uh, it's a, it's an uh, Amazon product, uh, but it's a lightweight uh, virtual machine to run container workload, uh, and uh, through uh, uh, so I, I you know we we talk to the. Uh, uh, to the uh, Kata container people, <laughs> uh, that's what uh, that's what uh, Kata is running uh, is running as their virtual machine, uh, and the choice was based on uh, the speed that uh, Firecracker was uh, providing. They had two other VM that were running, and I, I I have to look it up, but I can't find it uh, because they were, they had different models that they were trying before, and as of V one. As of V10 of uh, Kata container, we're using V15 of uh, Firecracker, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but 
uh, you know, the, it's the problem we're having too. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, that's always interesting to see how those technology that we open source or 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 not used outside. So that was the reason I was no, it, curious it, about it. It is used, and uh, the people that were uh, talking about it uh, during the summit were really happy about the technology because it really made their life uh, a lot easier. Uh, so if uh, if you have the slide for uh, so just to give you a little bit more context, so if I yeah, you have a question. Question, yeah. Is there a GPU support planned and stuff like that for Firecracker? On, fi on Firecracker, no. Oh. Probably not in the, the short term. Um, I know it was the infrastructure yeah, one. Yeah, there's a discussion around that. But the, design, the initial design goal for Firecracker was uh, for us to have a better isolation layer uh, for our serverless workloads. Because the way we do implement the serverless workloads were that uh, basically it was running in a container, but we don't trust the container for security purposes. So having super light VMs uh, that could be spawned super quickly and uh, where we could have hundreds or thousands of VMs on the same host with that very strong security uh, uh, isolation was helping us a lot increasing the density for serverless workloads. Yeah, so here yeah, it actually says so provide stronger workload isolation using harder visualization. So uh, so yeah, so uh, your uh, your hardware is basically at the uh, at the runtime level and uh, you just push it to the microphone. I'm oh, sorry. You push it uh, you push your your system Fuji RPC over to your hypervisor, so whatever your hypervisor can see, uh, you know, and that's what you can get in your uh, small virtual machine. But it's a similar discussion as to who is in charge here again, right? I mean, oh, Gvisor yeah. implements a Linux kernel in Go, and then uh, Firecracker, I'm not sure, sure what Firecracker I implements a full... Firecracker is uh, written in Rust, and um, it it runs a full Linux kernel. Okay. Yeah, and if you look, actually, uh, a lightweight one. But yeah, for people that have more that are interested, so that I put, like I said, I put a many URLs uh, for people that want more information. First, the information about Kata, uh, Firecracker, the uh, GitHub link, but there is also the uh, project update that uh, it's a forty-minute presentation on the project in Kata, and they talk about why they moved to Firecracker uh, specifically, uh, and and they made a really good use case at the time, uh, explaining you know because it, it it was all about the load time. <laughs> Uh, they really explain why they moved to uh, uh, to the technology because uh, they were able to sh to uh, limit the amount of time it was starting to start the microkernel in order to get things start uh, functional. However, uh, be super cautious about Firecracker because it has some design goals that will prevent using it in some cases. The design goal was. Uh, not to have something handling uh, multiple cores or that kind of stuff. It was really something super light, super fast to start, but that will not use more than one core. Yeah, and I think for HPC, this micro kernel thing is not really because we no, then have the no. hypervisor again. Yeah, but I mean, and, and the goal is not to extend uh, the features of Firecracker to cover some over needs. That's really to have something super specific that serve a super narrow purpose. Yeah. Cool. Okay, and I will say unikernels just, just once <laughs> because we have now the the. Um, I had that. I had that conversation with Salomon once. <laughs> that was fun. So we will have coffee break, break half an hour, and uh, we we'll continue with user use cases after, and then a broad discussion about everything we talked about today. So let's like go berserk on topics. Thanks.